God is good all the time. It's great to see you guys here this morning. So we're doing the whole business about divine appointments and opportunities. Um, I, uh, Del asked me a couple of weeks ago so, um, w- if I could preach, and I, I texted I text her and said, anything you want me to preach on in particular? And, uh, and she came back during church last Sunday, I might add, <laughs> um, uh, and, and said this is something she felt might be um, valuable at the moment. And I thought it was a great thing. It was up to me, she said, what I did, but I really felt it was a God moment in, in one sense. I want to talk about this in terms of how you might experience God and how you might operate. And if you're not yet a follower of Christ, I want to tell you something. God is willing to speak in you and through you to others. You get in a relationship with him and and it can be real fun. But there's a lot of Christians, I've got to say, actually don't do this. And yet, if you read in the New Testament, this is one of the key hallmarks of the Christian expression of faith in the community. It definitely is. Every part of the book of Acts has story after story after story after story of God speaking through people to others. It doesn't have story after story after story of people attending church, getting blessed, maybe having a word in church. It doesn't even have one story like that in that way. It has some things that talks about God's community, but the real story is not what happened inside the church, but what happened as a consequence of the church being together in Christ. Amen? So, one of the things I've noticed over the years, you know, and after 42 years of pastoring, you get to notice a few things. A lot of us, as, as humans, um, we live in our own little bubble. There's bubbles all over the place here. We live in our own little bubble. And uh, we kind of live in our own bubble that is sometimes spiritual and sometimes not. And often you go around and sometimes you'll bounce off each other and you'll, you'll share things and you'll see things, but really still we tend to live in our own bubble. Now this is actually a modern construction because in society in the old days, community was more important than the individual. We live in a society today Even if we don't think it's true, individuals matter more than community. And God's called us to what? To be in? Amen. He's not called us to be just individuals doing our own thing. There are a number of reasons for that, and I don't want to unpackage that entirely this morning, but except to say that when we're in community, then we're going to be healthy people. We're going to be protected. We're going to be uh, uh, stronger We're going to develop better in our lives. Our families are going to do uh, much better in in the long term. Uh, You know, sometimes in an individualistic society, we think we know how to do things better than other people. But sometimes God wants to speak to us. We often operate, in fact, in our own little bubble. We go through life in our own little bubble. We often operate with a division in our heads between when we are working with God and the rest of living. That's what happens. So, we, so you know, I'm, 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 I'm doing something for God right now and the rest of my week, you know, this is where the term came. It's interesting. Uh, secular people often refer to um, um, people they know who go to church as Sunday Christians. Why do they say that? Because the rest of the week, they know they're no different than them. They're no different. They're living their individualistic life, trying to get as much as they can for as long as they can. And they, they, you know, there's all sorts of things going on that aren't healthy. One of the things I remember uh, some years ago happening when I was younger. No, we we had a family situation where a fence needed building and a neighbour who actually had come out of the war, and he actually was missing an arm, 
and he, and he had a, a leg that really didn't operate. And, uh, he, you know, the, there was huge tension over the building of this fence between the two properties. And I came into pastoral ministry, and over the years, every now and again, I run across the identical story, except what surprises me sometimes is that Christians who get really upset with their neighbor because they won't pay for half the fence, they'll fight it. Now, legally, they, they need to, you know, according to the law. But why don't we act differently? Why don't we be generous? It's because we're so individualistic, we matter more than our neighbor. We want them to become followers of Jesus, but by hang, you'll pay or I'll take you to court. There's a contradiction in that kind of thinking. Amen? So, when we look at it, <clears throat> God wants us to walk close with him. And if we're walking close with him, it's different to being individualistic. In fact, if you watch the little man, you see, when we are walking close with him, one thing that happens... Listen to the song. The very old one. Now, amen. It's been ages looking for this song, and all sorts of people sang it. Do you know Elvis Presley sang it? If only. Well, he did. But lots of people sing it or have sung it in the church years ago. But is it real? You know? To some of you, it probably is. Some of you, you know, daily walking close to you on the emphasis of it. And so I want to I wanna ask the question, actually, what does that look like? Because that sounds all very powerful and very true. And I'm not even sure that a lot of the people who sang it understood what it even meant. It was just a nice song. I mean, I can name a number of uh, secular stars who sang that song on stage and, you know, and... Everybody from Christus Christopherson right through to, well, you know, all sorts of people. Bob Marley sang it as well. Wow. That blows the mind away, doesn't it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> that blows the mind away, Dave. Okay. So, so when, we, when, we, when we see it... Uh, you just you need to watch the bubble. Now I've got the things in order. <laughs> watch the bubble because this is what should be happening. So we ask the question, how do we walk closer with God? So how do we actually do it? Well, the bubble has to go. The individualistic bubble has to disappear. And we need to be people who are going to walk in community with God and do things his way. Now, let's think about what that might mean. I mean, that means all the time the Spirit of God's with us, whispering in our ear. That means if we're going to have him whispering in our ear, he's going to be walking with us wherever we go. Amen? I forgot to slow that one down. It was a bit fast, wasn't it? Maybe we should do it again. All right, here you go. This is running, okay? Spirit must have said run. All right? You see, the fact of the matter is that God wants us to really understand what it is to walk closer with him. You know, God wants us to walk close with him. So when we look at that, I want to talk about what that means in terms of the d divine appointments and opportunities because when the Spirit's whispering to us, we're going to have things happening in our lives that are different. God will lead each of us to divine opportunities when and if we are available and willing to trust him daily. At every moment. Years ago, I was getting on the plane, on a plane, and so happened Tepper was riding on the same plane. And there were two men that he knew getting on the plane. Now, I know Tepper, and you know Tepper well enough to know he's always looking for opportunities to share. And, and I was saying, okay, God, I want somebody to share with. Well, it turned out, that one of his friends ended up with a seat right next to me. Do you remember this, Tepa? Now, <clears throat> he wasn't a small man. In fact, I was sitting in my seat like this. And, uh, and we, we, I, I, I prayed before, Lord, 
Give me an opportunity to share with somebody. You put somebody next to me that you'd like me to talk with about your th- things. And uh, I sat there saying, okay, God, give me the right words. I will never forget that flight on that plane. Because that man, because of Tespa's testimony, was open to what I was able to share. See, we're the community of God's people. We're not individuals on our own, amen? And if it, I don't think if a relationship hadn't been there with Tepper, I don't think this man would have been as open as he was with me on the plane. It was an amazing experience at the time. So why do people not have many, if any, divine appointments? Because I, I could ask you to put your hand up. Do you have divine appointments almost every day? And some of you, or most of you probably would say, oh no, I didn't even think about asking God. You know, when, you, when, when, when we're living life with Christ, he's going to talk to us. So here's some reasons why. Some of us are unwilling to allow Jesus to be Lord. Jesus, you're going to get me to heaven, but that's all. We don't always say it in those words, but our actions portray it so clearly. Because... We expect it to listen to the Spirit, to heed the Spirit, to be guided by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit. He says when we're talking with people, he'll give us the right words to say. When we say, okay, God, but no, 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 I can't do that because fear or some other thing is making him, is, is sitting there. And, and fear, fear, fear of making a mistake or saying the wrong thing is something that often gets into our heads. No, I, I tell you, I've had the same thing happen. Now and again, I've felt a prompting of the Spirit, and I thought, oh, I don't know quite what to say to them. I always remember Wayne Patoa, who, who, who is pastoring up at um, Carterton now, was part of this church. He had meetings with government officials, and I was at one of those meetings. And Wayne drags this guy across who's a member of parliament. I won't say who it was because I need to respect their privacy. He drags him across, and he says, hey, Gary, I want you to meet such and such. And so I shook hands with that. And then he says, I've invited him to church, Gary. You need to convince him he needs to come. <laughs> Wayne's just so in their faces. But he gets away with it. I sometimes think if I was as big as Wayne and looked sort of, you know, in the chest like Wayne, I might get away with more. No, no, it's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with the courage you have in Christ. Amen? So fear should not pervade our lives. In fact, did you know the Scripture says very clearly that he has dealt with all our fears? So why do we keep trying to hang on to them? Huh? He dealt with them. Oh, no, 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 Jesus, don't take my fears away. I feel more secure. It's rubbish. But by holding on to them, that's what we're saying. I feel safer with my fears than I do with you, Jesus. You know what I would say to you? Be very fearful of God for that attitude. Scripture warns us. Amen? In an awesome way, not in a negative way. But there is a side to it that is hard. Okay, the third one. Sometimes we miss the cue. Somebody say something to us and, and we don't say what we could have said and we're standing there going, I've done this. Kick, 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 you silly boy. You missed it. You know, why didn't you tell him? Why didn't you tell her? And, and you know, sometimes, sometimes we just miss the cue. Sometimes when people find out we're followers of Jesus, they go really, really silent, and that makes us back off because we think that they're rejecting us. You know, actually the, only, the problem might be that they're really struggling with what they should say to us next because they don't know how to talk to a Christian because I've never had the opportunity with a Christian that's been able to talk with them with freedom to be able to operate in that vein. And sometimes the best thing we can say to them, hey, you know, you can say things, hey, what are you thinking right now? You need to have a bit of a word of God on that, I think. Or you might, you might just sit there and say, Give, say to the Lord, just quietly, not out loud so that they can't hear you, you know. 
to say, Lord, give me insight. Give me words right now. Give me something that I need to do. And, and, and the slightest thing that comes to you, you need to act on that right then and there. Don't delay, because if you do, you'll miss the opportunity. And then you'll be kicking yourself. You know, one way of getting sorcians is to kick yourself. All right? Spiritually sorcians. You know? And, and God doesn't want us to do that. So when there's cues there, and sometimes they can be the most obtuse things, and sometimes they can come across as pat sort of things that people sort of say to us. You know, people ask us questions. And they say, oh, I've been asked this question before, and it's always, you know, they're just looking for a fight or argument. I always take people seriously with their question and treat them with respect, even if they're trying to set me up. Because in actual fact, I'll give you some keys later, a little later as to how to get past that kind of issue that you end up facing. You see that we are meant to live with God leading us every day. We all know that, don't we? Amen? A divine appointment, therefore, <coughs> is a meeting with another person that God has specifically and unmistakably arranged. You just may not have recognized it. I believe that every person I meet, in God's eyes, is an opportunity for the kingdom. So, I've heard people, preachers say things like, you know, go out and ask God to show you the person he wants you to talk to today, the person. Well, that might be a good start, but that's not a finish line. How many people can you share with today, Lord? Lord, give, show me every person that I can take an opportunity with. That's the thing God wants us to do. It's fun. It gets really fun. I'll tell you some stories shortly. The Holy Spirit sets up such encounters for us. It's not our job to set them up. He will set them up, okay? Secondly, so that you can be a blessing to the other person. It's to bless them. Thirdly, as a consequence, you will know the power of being what? Blessed. You see, often that encounter will be with someone you have never even met before. In fact, can I say this? Some people say, no, I'm far more co co comfortable talking to people I know. But when they meet the people they, uh, they know and I talk with them afterwards, did you manage to talk with them? Oh, no, I know them really well and I'm, I'm just taking my time to win them to Jesus. Yeah. I never forget the song our team used to dance to by a woman called Leslie Phillips. The song was called Gina. And the song screamed, Gina! That's how it started. And what had happened with Gina, with Leslie Phillips, this friend of hers, Gina, was actually a real person. Leslie had decided she was going to befriend her friend before she told her she was really a follower of Jesus. So for a long time, she'd been just befriending this woman and had never shared Christ with her. And the reason that Leslie Phillips ended up writing a song is because Gina ended up in a terrible car accident where she got burnt alive. And the anguish in Leslie Phillips' life because she hadn't told her about Christ was huge. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, that type of song's called a lament, feeling sorry and horrible about what they did. And that's why that song was written by Leslie Phillips. Very, very powerful song. When our people danced it, we used to use a coffin on stage. And I remember one of our girls laying in the coffin and uh, I wish I could bring you back again to one of the lines. And at that point, we would get this dancer. The only move they did in the whole dance, apart from laying in the coffin, was to raise their foot and their head and their hand just above the edge of the coffin, then drop back down again. And every time, every time we did it, you should have seen the audience. Oh, I didn't expect the body to be in there, did they? I wish I could bring you back again. You can't bring people back again, but you can get it right before they die. Amen? God wants us to realize that. What's happened here? Did I bang it accidentally? Sorry, guys. Here we go. <clears throat> now we go to the next one. Divine appointments come in all sorts of ways. 
They do. They're really strange, some of them. You know, <clears throat> sometimes not easy to recognize, like bumping into somebody or circumstances, a crisis, even having a car accident with somebody. Look, guys, don't go around driving into other cars, all right? But if something has happened, if it can be a great opportunity. Sometimes, just circumstances. Paulie and I, when we were in Tasmania years ago, we had a series of circumstances that were a disaster to us. We were doing an outreach in a little place near Hobart, a little town near Hobart, and, and uh, <coughs> we are meant to be running this group. And, uh, and we, we, we kind of, everything went wrong. We, we went with the young people that we'd put on this youth thing in the afternoon, and, and they weren't Christians. They weren't followers of Jesus, this whole group. And... Uh, so we ran this event, and we, part of the event, we went swimming in the sea, but the sea was so cold in Tasmania that I froze so badly, and I didn't even realize my wedding ring had disappeared. It had gone in the sea, and because uh, I was cold, my body had shrunk, and it just disappeared. So I wanted to go and look for it, and I'd look for it in the water right then, and I got back to the hall where we were meant to be doing this outreach, and... Um, I wanted to get back in the car, and I got to my car to go back and try and find the ring in the, in the sand in the sea. Probably a fat chance of finding it, but just hoping. I was really upset. I lost my ring. And as I got in the car, I went to drive off. I felt the Spirit of God say, no, leave it there. You need it back in the hall. So I got back in the hall, still feeling a bit traumatized. And we had a little team. I was leading this particular team. And one of the g girls in the group, she's a bit, her sight was a little bit um, difficult. So she'd get distances wrong. And she had a full teapot of, of boiling water. And she put it on the bench, so she thought, but it wasn't on the bench, it was only partly on the bench. So it tipped over and spilt all over Pauline and burnt her. At that point, I was going to go to the med centre and take Pauline. I needed to get her to the medical centre <coughs> to rescue Pauline. And I went to go, the Spirit of God said, no, you'll let um, Margie take her. She's a nurse. And I, that was really hard because my wife was injured and the Spirit was saying no to me. So just after they left, there was a little group of youth that was sitting around and one girl, I, I shan't forget her name, her name was Delia, the name I'd never heard before. She said to me, Gary, can we ask you some questions? I said, Lord, give me wisdom. And she asked one of those questions, and I'm not going to tell you questions because your mind will start going everywhere. She asked one of those questions, which lots of non-Christians ask and are quite insincere about their question. They're not really sincere about what they're asking at all. They just want to talk and they don't know how else to talk with you, but they know there's some questions that happen in society. But I, <clears throat> I know when, when a person asks you a question, there's a golden opportunity to give a God answer rather than just a human answer. I said, Lord, in an arrow prayer without, I didn't say it out loud, I said, Lord, you show me the words I should say right now. And the Lord said to me very clearly, answer her question, take her seriously, she will ask another question. That was all I got. So I, I, he, he didn't say, these are the words you are to say. You know? In other words, he wasn't saying, you're the puppet and you'll speak when I pull the strings. He said, just answer the question. So I did. I answered that question, answered another question, answered another question. And there were seven youth there, two at Delia and another girl, and the others were boys, young men. Conversation went and went on, went on and went on and and at one point, when one of, the question, one of the people asked the question, Delia and then three others burst into tears. And right there and then, I led them to Christ. One of the most powerful things. If I had not listened to the Spirit, that would not have happened. You know, I still very clearly remember that conversation, I still very clearly remember all the circumstances that were there. You know, that's the way it goes. <clears throat> you know, there are, 
there, there are all sorts of things that we can face. The key is to expect di- divine appointments. Don't go around hoping that God will come along, you walk along after, and you go, Hey! Get your attention. He should already have your attention all day long. That's the truth. When you get them, remember it's not about being friendly. Some Christians get these divine appointments given to them by God and they know what to say and they thought, I'll make friends with them, which is the same thing as what Leslie Phillips said. I'll make friends with them. God's not in the business of making friends. He's in the business of saving people. And then they become his friends and his children. And you should hold the same line as God. We're meant to be like Jesus, aren't we? Amen? It is about you being the vessel to share Christ. Otherwise, you're just wanting to be liked. If you just want to be liked, get over yourself. Really. Honestly. Is it that important that you're liked? Because the person you might want to be liked, by, for one, might not like you because you're not really being a true Christian and they know it. Or they might like you for a while and then decide, nah, so you're not going to be liked in a long term. In any case, get them connected with God and then Jesus tells them they have to like you. So you would be on a better wicket there, eh? Amen? All right. They're often unexpected. Divine appointments are often unexpected. They don't happen in the way that we always expect that they will happen. Look at Acts chapter 16, verses 9 to 10. Paul is going to Philippi. God had led him in a vision to Macedonia. And what happened? He ends up in prison. Now, most Christians at that point go, Oh, God, you let me down. But that's not what happened. They're in prison. You know, the scripture says, rejoice always. Paul wrote that. Why did he write that? Because he learned, learned how to do it. So in prison, what were they doing? They were praising the Lord. Paul and Silas having a, a, a worship party, just the two of them, with a whole lot of pagans around, thieves, murderers, um, liars, and all sorts of people, all in prison. Some of them probably innocent and been put in prison when they shouldn't have been there. And so there's a whole party going on, praise Jesus, and Suddenly an earthquake hits. It rips the prison apart. And so the jailer, in those days, if he let the prisoners go, he'd be tortured and killed. And so what actually happened, the jailer, on this occasion, got his sword out and was about to kill himself. He wanted to kill himself rather than have other people do it because they'd make a really messy job of it. And, uh, and, he, and Paul says, no, 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 don't, don't do that. He said, we're all still here. The jailer recognized that God was involved in this somehow, and he undoes the shackles of, of, of actually, we don't know whether he undid the shackles because the Bible says that some of the shackles had already undone. So in any case, he takes Paul and Silas, and he gives them a meal, sits them down with his family in the middle of the night, and, he lead, and Paul and Silas lead them to Christ. Imagine if I'd been sitting in prison going, Paul, me, 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 me. You know, because that's a temptation when we get into difficult places, isn't it? You know? We don't even have to get into prison to do that. Some of us in this room only need somebody to reject us and go, Oh, God, I'm feeling horrible. (laughs) It is horrible when people reject you. And it's very, very hard sometimes to make a choice to rejoice. I know that personally. I find that extremely, that particular thing, I find extremely hard because I really love people. And, and it's, just, it's, just, it's just awful. But what are we going to do? We've got to rise up and walk with Christ. Amen? So even in the midst of trauma, we can still be glorifying to Christ. Amen? So when we look at it, here they are bound in prison there. Even that trip to the jail was a a God appointment because he used Paul to bring salvation to a jailer and his family, his whole family, according to the text. So so God will overrule, amen? So in terms of experiencing (coughs) divine things, we need to be people who are going to be learning to hear the Spirit. 
If we listen to the Spirit, He will sometimes tell us to go someplace that does not make sense for a divine appointment. Let's have a look at what that might mean. Philip and the eunuch. Philip's told to go out to the uh, out to the road, and you know it was kind of like a main road, except it didn't have tar seal in those days. Uh, a lot of them had cobblestones, but some of them were just plain dirt. And so he's told out to go out in this road, out in the wop wops. So Philip went. He probably, I've sat and looked at the story. He's probably thought, "Why on earth are you take me out in the wop wops, God?" Out in the country, for those that don't know what what this means. Why are you taking me out there? No, no, no. We don't have any record of that in Scripture at all. He goes out there, standing by the road, and along comes this Ethiopian eunuch. He's a, he's a ruler, and eunuchs had, had their private parts removed as a part of the sacrifice to be, I hold the position they held. And so he was riding along, reading from the book of Isaiah. And the consequence of this story was that he, uh, Philip starts running along beside the chariot, which I'm actually not sure would have actually been seen in a good light in those days, but for some reason the eunuch, and he asked the eunuch a question about whether he understood what the text was, sort of thing, what are you reading from? And so he, the eunuch invites Philip up into the chariot, and they're riding along, going someplace, and eventually the eunuch becomes a follower of Jesus, and he says, hey, there's some water here, let's stop and get baptised. So some people say, oh, well, you know, um, you know, he, he baptised uh, privately. No, 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 no. You have to understand the eunuchs. When eunuchs went for a ride, it wasn't just a eunuch and his chariot and his horses. It was a eunuch and a mob of people following, a huge mob of people. One of the most powerful testimonies uh, at that point was the fact that the eunuch, who was a leader, was saying, I have decided to become a follower of Jesus and all these people witnessed what God was doing. Powerful story, a very, very powerful story when you look at it. And you see, see, that was an opportunity. You know the one of the strange things that happens in a story? It's one I've read and reread and tried to figure out. You can't really figure it out. Because he's there with the eunuch, he baptizes him, and then it says, he said he disappeared. It didn't say he ran away. He disappeared and suddenly appeared in a little town called Azatos, and he continued doing God's ministry. Some people call it Philip's transport, you know. I mean, hey, Star Trek and, got, and they'd have got nothing on God. He did it way before they thought of it. You know? God does these strange things. But you can only do it, he can only do those things in and through you if you're actually listening to him. I mean, in terms of this, I want to say it again. Expect what? Oh, that sounds like cat's choir. Let's try it again. Expect. Yeah, expect them. Each day. Don't care whether it's Sunday or whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and you can have Saturday off if you want, but you'll be in trouble with God. There's no holidays. Just kidding you. All right? God wants us to be really available to him all the time. And, and one of the things you need to do, though, it's not just saying, okay, God, show me. Scripture's really clear. Be ready for divine appointments. 2 Timothy uh, 4.2 says, Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. And this is a really great scripture because you might say, oh, I don't think this person's ready for it. It's nothing to do with whether they're ready. It's whether to do whether it's in season or out of season. In God's vocab, out of season is still in season to preach the word. So even if you don't think it's the right moment, it could be. Now, you don't have to be stupid. Let me, let me tell you. We had this guy on an outreach we did years ago, and he was from a local, um, another church, but the pastor asked me if we could take him on our team into Nambassa to do outreach. Um, Nambassa was a big secular festival where everybody except us Christians and one or two odd bods uh, didn't wear clothing. And we were the only ones who did, mostly. And... Uh, <clears throat> So we were there, and this guy, this is what he was doing. He's going up to people. Can I borrow somebody? Can I borrow somebody I feel safe with? Hedy's already been up here, so I won't pick on her. I'll, I'll get, uh, I'll get, I'll get Tornor. <laughs> she got caught off guard that time. 
So, she, you know, she's coming up. Give her a hand, come on, she's willing to. She got up straight out of her seat. I like that. She's hearing the spirit. <laughs> okay? This is what this guy was doing. Now, you, you put yourself in her shoes. Imagine that's you here, right? He's going up. And I, found him doing this. I said, what are you doing? I'm witnessing in the power of the Spirit. And I says, what do you mean you're witnessing the power of the Spirit? He said, you know, the Scripture says that if I use tongues, that God will use me and he'll bless me. And, he'll... and I said, it's not about you. How do you think the other person feels, I said to him. But then... So I, no, God would be speaking to them, he said. I said, well, the face didn't tell me God was speaking to them. Huh? If God was speaking to them, their face wouldn't be looking so concerned and wondering whether you're a psychiatric maniac. And I said to him, ah, brother, I want you to come back to the tent. I want to do some re-education of your thinking. And so he did. That guy caused a barrier between every Christian that went to talk with him after that during the ambassador. That guy shut that person's spiritual possibilities and potential off by being stupid. Thank you, Heather. Let's give her a hand. Come on. She was all of you, all right? <laughs> so, so I... I did. I sat down and talked with the guy and said, well, what was that all about? And he said, oh, I really believe that tongues is a gift. It's been, and I said, well, hold on, let me show you 1 Corinthians 14. Actually, he says, uh, if they don't understand, then it's not going to be any help to them. Actually, 1 Corinthians 14 is really confusing on this whole topic, but because on the other place it says, if, they, if, you, if you do speak in tongues, people get saved. You know? But I believe that only happens in the context of the rest of the text, which is interpretation, words of prophecy and words of knowledge happen. Words that people can understand in five, an intelligible language. Paul said these words, I, would far, I speak tongues more than all of you, which is quite a brag, really, when you think about it. But I'd far rather speak in a language that's understood so that they might hear. Amen? Then act on the opportunity of a divine appointment. A Samaritan woman, for example, is, <coughs> is another example of divine appointment. So Jesus sits down, he sits down, he, he models this. He, he sits down, he's beside a well, and this um, woman of Samaria, um, I always remember who she, what, what country she comes from because she was quite a large woman. She was a woman of some area, you know. Um, and... Uh, and Jesus is sitting there, and he starts a conversation with her. Now, the two things that you won't understand when you read this text, one is a man would never talk to a woman in those days like that. Unless the husband's there. And it was okay for that to happen. We don't understand that. Some of you, um, you know, some of the Muslim women that live in New Zealand some of our, one or two times, our, one or two of our guys have tried to talk to those women. That is no, no. Woman to a woman, man to a man. And that was the same in the Jewish culture, you see. And so Jesus is talking to, her, to this woman. Now, she wasn't a Jewish, she was a Samaritan, which believed in God and had the whole of the, uh, the Old Testament as their, part of their belief system, but they weren't uh, in, in the main Jewish community. They were sort of separate, considered to be a cult group. And Jesus ends up unraveling the stuff and, and gives her a word about herself. And she says, oh, I don't have a husband. And he said, you're right. You had five husbands, and the one you're with right now isn't your husband. Whew. You know what happened? God spoke into her heart. She goes running back and says, come and hear this man. He's told me everything about my life. Now, this is the importance of actually not only hearing that God wants you to talk, but hearing about what God wants you to say. Because there are points when he'll say, this person needs to hear this. doesn't give it to you word for word. Just you need to, and as soon as you open your mouth, you find you sometimes, I found myself saying things I hadn't pre-thought. It just came, and I had the sense that the Holy Spirit was in it, and he said he'd give me the word to speak. And here he's giving me the word to speak, and people get saved. 
Don't you want to see that happen? Amen? Amen! Boy, you guys should be shouting at this point, you know? All right. <clears throat> One of the stories I have, in, we used to do an outreach in Karamea, which is the northernmost point of the west coast of the South Island. We had an outreach running there. We used to have a big team of 23 of us um, or so. And <clears throat> one day we were sitting in, in our group preparation group early in the morning and this guy was headed off to the beginning of the Heafy track and he was going to try and walk, I think it was about nine, I'm not sure it was nine miles or nine k's. It's sort of, it was a changeover period during that time. But it was a long way. And I just felt God prompting me and saying, you need to take this guy with you. And you need to take him to the beginning of the track. I'm sitting there struggling because I want to be in the group and, and learning, you know, as a study group. I want to be in the group and learning, but Spirit said to me, I want you to go. And so I said, I felt this, and some of the group said, Gary, you just, you know, you should be here. And blah, 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 blah. But the leader, Noel, said to me, Gary, you're sensing the Spirit right now. If you're sensing the Spirit, you go. So I got my van feeling a, bit, a wee bit upset, a wee bit traumatised at these particularly the university student academics who used to intimidate me awful because I was the only one that wasn't. And so some of them, they'd try and pull their academic thing on me at times. And one of them, even as I was leaving, even though Noel had said that, said something. I was like, oh man, you get off the grass. I didn't say it to him, but I thought it. Okay? So I get this guy in my van. I said, I'll take you to the track. We're going around, and at one point on the road, there's a, the road goes straight up and there's a really sharp corner. And I took the corner a little bit you know, fairly quickly in my old CF Bedford Bound, my chocolate brown one. We, oh no, no, it wasn't a CF, sorry, it was a Leyland 15. Um, and we were <coughs> going around the corner, I had a big engine in it, going around the corner. I was going quite quickly and I forgot that our suitcase was sitting on the little cabinet because I decked it up with little bed and cabinets and all the rest of it and I built this thing. Little we holiday home, Paulie and I used to go off and take rides and take weekends away and things like that. And, and this case was sitting on the top and it slid across, because I was going a little bit quickly. It flew across, hit the door, dropped on the handle. The door opened. My suitcase with all our stuff in it went <laughs> splat all over the road. So I looked, sorry, mate, I'm not going to get there this quickly. I'm going to have to pick the stuff up. So I pulled over and backed up and I was putting all the stuff back in the van and he was just watching me. We get back in the van and we're driving along and I'm, I'm praising the Lord and chatting away with him. He says, I, I just want to ask you a question. I said, what's that, mate? He said, how come you didn't get upset? How come you didn't get angry? I mean, if that had happened to me or it happened to my family, I mean, the air would be blue with foul language and he t t told me a few bits of and his family and how he would cope with it. I said, oh, because the Lord changed me. This is what he's done in my life. I, you know, in the old days, I, I probably would only been angry. I probably gone out and stomped on some stuff, jumped back in my van and drove it off and left it there. But, but Jesus has changed me. You know what happened? We get to the head of the track and he asked me, could you pray for me? Right there at the head of the track. And I am sitting there praying. And the reason... He told me it was because of the way I handled a stupid situation. So you just never know. You know. All I did was say, okay, God, you want me to take him to the end of the track? God saw me driving around the corner too quickly for the bag to be there. God was having a laugh in heaven. I'm sure all the angels go, yeah, that was a good one, God. <laughs> you knew he would do that, eh? <laughs> yeah. And God, with confidence, was able to say at that point in my life, you watch how he handles this. I'm going to turn it around. Are you willing to be available to God? They put me the ding, ding, ding up, but I'm sorry I'm taking a bit longer than I usually do because I don't preach very often nowadays. Okay, here we go. Look for the opportunities you cannot see. And 1 Peter, he says this, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone, not just some, who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So don't be aggressive. Don't go around doing crazy things like speaking tongues at people as if they're going to understand. 
You need to do it with gentleness and you need to show respect. Don't think you're superior. Otherwise, you know what's going to happen? People are going, here comes another one of Indian headhunter Christians. They're just out to sculpt me. If you show respect and gentleness, they won't think like that. They will, they will equally show that respect back. Sometimes God will give you a word for the other person. It not, may not make sense to you. It may not make sense to you. Give it in any case. I remember somebody about three years ago giving a word in the church here, and at the time I stood there thinking, oh, if that word had been screened past the elders or myself, that one wouldn't have got through. You know? Boy, did God rebuke me that day. Because a person came forward and uh, his visitor and wanted to make a first step to become a follower of Christ. Why? Because when that word person spoke, words that didn't make any sense to us, language that they used, it was just odd. I'd never heard this person talk like this. And that should have alerted me to the fact that it might be the Spirit of God. But it didn't, because I was sick on that occasion. And there it was, and he said, it's the language that's used in my job that's used in no other job. And he says, I knew God was in here and speaking because I didn't know whether I believed God until that happened. You see? I can't remember who gave the word, but somebody here might remember that it was you. All right. God appoint, appointments make our Christian journey really valuable and exciting because there's no more fun than to know that God spoke through you and somebody's touched. Amen? When we let God work with us, then it increases and stabilizes our faith as well. You're certain of the things that you do not see because God operates in a way that you do not understand, but he works through you in any case. Amen? So outcomes of divine appointments or opportunities are these. How we respond to a divine appointment will determine the blessings we see. If we're not going to be available to God's divine appointments, we're going to miss out on a whole bunch of blessings in our lives. Seeing people's lives changed is one of the most awesome things you could ever do in your life, honestly. Our lives can be full of divine appointments. On Friday, we took my daughter's car because it had run out of oil in the gearbox and wasn't in good condition. And uh, so we went over to oil changes. And um, we're standing outside oil changes while the guy's work on Adele's car, and I've had quite a, quite a bit to do with all changes. I know the staff and that because my cousin owns the place, and I built all the equipment for them for, for the place. And um, <clears throat> standing there, there's this other guy standing there. Dave and I are standing there. It's a bit cold, wasn't it, Dave? And we're standing there, and I start a conversation with him, and Dave gets involved in the conversation. Before, before I know where I am, Dave, and I can't remember the question he asked, but he asked a question that went, ping. Now, I, vaguely I remembered seeing this guy's face, but I couldn't remember why. Very, very vaguely I remembered seeing his face. And Dave was right in on him about, you know, it would be good to, for you to connect with Jesus. He straightened his face, you know. Couldn't have got much straighter. And uh, I thought, wow, God. And so I stood there and I walked around and prayed, Lord, Help him, help Dave. He's, he, he's the one that's, you know, you've given him the words to say this time. And so, at the end of it, you know something funny? And those who've been around here for a long time will understand this. The guy told us, I, I've met you before, he said to me. He actually knew Dave as well because he used to buy things from Dave that Dave doesn't sell anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, he's. Irene Piper's nephew. Irene used to be in the church here many years ago and died a few years ago. And he had been touched by Irene's life in a way. I'm sure if Irene was in heaven listening to him, she was probably dancing the bilio out of herself in heaven because he had touched her life and Dave raising the question with him was shifting the ground for him. Isn't that awesome? So finish with that. Be available to God. He wants to use you. He wants to bless you. But most of all, he wants to touch other people's lives and bless their lives through you. Amen? I think um, I want to give an opportunity for, for people to make a response this morning. We're not going to all hang around here. Um, there's a cup of tea going to be available. I think it's going to be announced by somebody. I better, I better let them do that. 
But the thing I want to say to you, if you know that you would like to step up in this area that we've been talking about this morning, some people go to cup of tea, some of you stay here and get some prayer, some people could help us pray for people, and, uh, and then they'll go and have a cup of tea afterwards. But look for the appointments. But if you haven't been quite making it there, come down and ask God to to do something special, to shift your heart, to shift your mind, to shift the way that you speak and the actions you take. God bless you.